Good morning, familia. Before we get started, I just wanted to honor two more women in our group. I'm just super grateful for the life of Rachel Maury and my wife, Sophie. They work uh, tirelessly to get the annual report done. Uh, Rachel designed the whole thing. They put together the whole thing. They were translating into Spanish, uh, both of them translating into Spanish. Good job, Rachel. Uh, so it was such a beautiful uh, way to honor what God's doing among us. This is not about one language, but one kingdom, and, and the beauty of God bringing nations together and languages together. So it's, we're dreaming that next year we'll, we'll get in trouble with one more language, right? Let's, let's dream that God wants to bring the nations and, and the languages together, and we will worship in different languages and Thank you so much for making this happen, because this, this speaks way more about who we are and who we are dreaming and believing God that we are becoming, a multicultural family, a diverse family, and that's so beautiful to witness, so thank you so much. Tomorrow's our wedding anniversary, so I love you, baby. Yes. We will celebrate tonight with Papi's barbecue, for sure, and I'll sing some Mexican Mexican Roman songs to my bride's eyes. I mean, ears. Besame mucho. So we'll do that, but not right now. We're going to go to the Word of God. Uh, hey, easy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. These guys are speaking about fashion. Fashion has its mistakes. This shirt has a mistake. It has a label attached in the front of this. I don't know why, but you cannot take it off. So every time I preach, I get my injured. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I had to find a, a Batman band-aid of my kids. And I'm wearing Batman right here. You want to see it? No, no, no. Oh, oh. Okay, I'll show you. No, 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 no. I won't show you. Because I want to be invited next year. I want to be here, I want puppies, I want five guys, and I, and I want you guys in that order. No, 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 oh, no, no, love you guys, love you so much, and we're beyond grateful to be here, it's been uh, so beautiful what God's been doing among us, and I'm so grateful that we are family together, and uh, that God's been doing such, such a beautiful thing, uh, and I say beautiful way too much. But I, I really believe that when we, just, when we just witness the work of God and we just see in anticipation in our hearts what's about to come, I'm just moved in my heart. Um, and today we're going to be in the Word of God, in the book of Zechariah. I got in so much trouble trying to translate my thoughts into English in this word, but I, I, I really feel this is the right word for us this morning. We're going to be in Zechariah, and before we read uh, the Word of God, I want to give some context about what's happening in the story of God at this moment of history in Zechariah. Uh, we know he's part of the minor prophets, and it's not a minor prophet because of lack of importance, but because of the length of their books. Each one has a, uh, it's a small book with a big impact in the redemptive story of God. And we can group these minor prophets uh, according to the time of their ministries in relation to the exile, uh, either before or after. So uh, today we, we will read and we will explore and we will see it uh, in, in the book of Zechariah, whose ministry took place after exile. So we know that... Uh, Israel ended up divided into two kingdoms after Solomon's death. The nation lived in mercy and idolatry for many years and abandoned the covenant that God had made with Abraham and David. Uh, yet we see God remaining faithful to fulfill his promise to them among all these years. So they ended up living in exile in Babylon uh, for over 70 years. And now a remnant is finally returning to Judea to rebuild Jerusalem. Several prophets announced that this captivity would happen, but that the nation would not be completely destroyed. So Daniel had prophesied that one day they would be allowed to return. And when the Persians finally conquered Babylon 
uh, God moves the heart of King Cyrus of Persia to allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem. So Zechariah was a priest. He was born in Babylon. Uh, he's now returning to Jerusalem with a group of about 50,000 people. And Zechariah is a contemporary of another a minor prophet called Haggai. And this is so interesting because both were kind of a Batman and Robin ministry. They, they do ministry together. They were, they were called to the same ministry with two different styles. And I really love this because it's two prophets, different personalities. Haggai is that kind of prophet that points his finger to your face. And he goes straight forward of the things that he is being called to say. Uh, and Zechariah is more of a mystic kind of prophet. He is a poet prophet. And, and he received wild visions from God. In one night, he got eight visions. Uh, like the visions of Daniel or like the visions from Revelations. Very symbolic visions. Very poetic visions. So we, 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 we are witnessing Zechariah being this poet prophet. Uh, two very different styles, and God uses them for the same purpose. And that's very meaningful because I really love the way God chooses us. So different, so diverse, and yet we all have part to play in his story. We all find purpose in his kingdom, and that's the beauty of being a part of this body. So Zechariah, uh, he fits between the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. God speaks through visions at different moments in scripture. And it's so fascinating to me that God speaks to their prophets in visions. And I think there is something about the poetic beauty of a vision that actually paints a much more intense and colorful picturing of minds transcending time and cultures. Uh, so whether we read these visions when they were written or thousands of years later, we can still feel the impact of the prophet voices awakening our faith and imagination to ambition and believe in the future that God has promised us. And I really believe that these words, specifically the third prophetic voice and the fourth prophetic voice of Zechariah in this book, are significant for us today. So he gets eight visions uh, that God gives him in one night. He's sent by God to bring hope in the midst of cynicism, in the midst of uh, weakness, in the midst of people being uh, uh, definitely discouraged. He's been sent to encourage the people of God to return to the rebuilding of the temple of God. He comes with, a vision, with visions of hope with visions of a bright future and promises about the great messianic king to come. Have you ever been in a group where, where everybody is like very in a very dark moment and then a very happy person jumps into the scene? <laughs> Have you ever been that person that you get in the room and, hey guys, what's up? And everybody's like, hmm, like very dark. Have you ever been that person? So Sakurai is exactly that person at this point. He comes with encouragement. He comes with visions that comes from God in the midst of people that are very cynic at this point and very unbelieving that God's actually about to do something new. They were a very small group led by a guy named Zerubbabel. Out of one million Israelites in Babylon, only 50,000 of them actually decided to return. Zerubbabel has a huge and really complex job ahead of him. So Zerubbabel, he's the governor of the region of Judea and a direct descendant of King David. The priority of these people returning to Jerusalem is rebuilding God's temple. So they came with excitement. They come with expectation at first. But soon they encounter many challenges. So the excitement starts to disappear. They came with excitement. Now they're facing many threats. They are surrounded by enemies with Samaria to the north. Additionally, there is pressure from the Persian uh, nation. They begin to rebuild, to rebuild, rebuild, yes, rebuild. They begin to rebuild, but they can't really move forward. They realize they don't have enough resources. They are not skilled artisans or builders. They don't seem to be the right people to get this great work in front of them done. They're just as small, unskilled, and unresourced group of people. 
Furthermore, this temple that they're about to build is way less impressive than Solomon's temple. It is smaller. It is simpler. In fact, the older leaders that came with this 50,000 people group that came back to Jerusalem cried over the foundation of this new temple. It was so insignificant. <laughs> Comparing with its former's glory in the days of Solomon, with the insignificant beginning of the foundations of this temple, that they watched the work and they just started to cry. <laughs> we see that in Ezra 3 verse 12. Let's read it. But many of the older priests... Levites and other leaders who had seen the first temple wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. The others, however, were shouting for joy. In addition to that, they have no resources or capacity to rebuild. So for all these reasons, now they are living in fear and apathy. This is a common thing that could happen to all of us. We need to make a decision. We find these two groups, a group that's weeping and a, and a group that's encouraging and shouting with joy. What would be the difference among, the, the, uh, among these two groups of people? They are looking at the same thing with a different attitude. So fear and apathy usually grows when doubt comes in our lives. Maybe others with more impressive foundations can do it. You know, like maybe, maybe other people with more resources, maybe, maybe people with more skillful people in their teams, maybe they could be part of this dream. Not us. We are not skilled. We're not qualified. We don't have the resources. This is not about us. This is, Sorobabel is, is, you need to find a different group of people. We're not the right people. We're not qualified. Maybe others. Maybe people with mid-sized churches only. Maybe people uh, with large churches and large resources could start thinking and dreaming about Multiply, but not us. So visualize for a moment the last years, the last 10 years of our leadership. All the things that have happened, all the things that you expected to happen, but they haven't happened I can think of a list of things that I would have seen already fulfilled in my life, in our church, in my leadership at this point. And I think we can all make a list. If we would place on the screen a question which would be at this point of my life and ministry, I imagined, how would you complete that phrase? That we have been a larger church, that we would have more resources, that we have raised more leaders, that we will have planted more churches. Only you know deep down what phrase completes that sentence for you. I know what deep down that sentence completes for me. Tim Keller said, worry is not believing God will get it right. And bitterness is believing God got it wrong. So first they were worried and fearful. But then they became, they became cynic and bitter. So they ended up abandoning the rebuilding of the temple for 20 years. Let's put it to rest. This vision about building temples, it's just complicated. Let's just find the top shelf and just leave it there. Let's just look for the storage room that nobody wants us to see in our house and just put it back there. And we need to make a decision. I think when we see that verse, I think we need to make a decision. What's the attitude that we will choose? Is it an attitude of fear, passivity, or an attitude of faith? Sometimes it is a kind of a happy unbelief. It's like, you know what? I'm just going to sit here and rejoice in the Lord of the work that my brothers and sisters are doing. This is amazing. Look at them carrying that wagon, pulling that wagon. God bless them. I'm even going to pray for them from a distance. But passion, without, without action, it's only pity. We just see from a distance. What I really believe, God wants to put something in our hearts. He wants to steer something in our hearts. 
When the small beginning seems so insignificant, when things haven't worked as we expected, will we have faith to believe what we still cannot see? Somebody once said the future has two handles, faith and fear. But it is essential to grab a hold of the future with faith. And this won't happen through personal motivation. This won't happen by human efforts. This won't happen because we're coming on an agreement right now. Okay, one, two, three, we're going to have faith. But because of the spirit that lives within us. 2 Timothy 1 verse 6 says, For this reason I remind you. Paul the Apostle is reminding Timothy. He says, I remind you to fan into flame the, the gift of God which is in you. Through the laying on my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So this is not because we are strong. Actually, it's all the way around. As Dave and Liz were reminding us this morning. It's not because we are self-determined, but it is because the spirit of power is in us. So fan into flame the gift of God in you and in your house. And in the midst of all this discouragement and apathy, Zachariah is sent to prophesy a good future. He's sent to prophesy for God's people. He's sent with a word of encouragement. Zachariah's prophetic voice is sent in vision to, to encourage specifically the two characters. In the verses that we are uh, reading together this morning. So the first one is encouraging Joshua, the high priest of this little remnant. The priest without a temple. So he's encouraging Joshua. And I, will, I, want, I want us to read these verses in Zechariah 3, verse 1 to 4. Zechariah is getting this vision. So this is the third vision he gets in this encounter with God at night. Part of the eight visions. And it says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at, at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And we know that Jerusalem has committed a great number of sins. And, and now Joshua, the priest, is standing before the Lord. Imagine yourself having this Isaiah 6 moment, uh, standing before the Lord, the lightning in God's beauty. So here's Joshua, the priest, representing all the people of God. They're standing before God, and suddenly, <clears throat> eh, I have a list of things I'd like to say. Satan comes in the scene. So he starts bringing all these accusations of all their failures, all their shortcomings, all the things they've done wrong, all their sins. He brings all of the list of the things that they are guilty of. And the only time that Satan speaks truth is when he accusates us. He's right. Oh, right? Think about it. I just let leave you with that thought. He's right. All those shortcomings are truth. But then a voice from heaven is heard. And God speaks in third person. It says, the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Satan comes with all these accusations. He's right. And you know what? He's right about the accusations. He stands against me. But God says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Reject your accusation, says Satan, and listen to this beautiful phrase. This man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. I love it. If I would get a tattoo in my life, that would be it. <laughs> a burning stick that's been snatched from the fire. Jim Peterson says, surprise! Everything was going up in flames, but I reach in and I pull out Jerusalem. That's what God's doing. Yes, it hasn't been easy. 
there has been pain. The fire has burned us a little bit in seasons. We've been born in the fire in some seasons. And we have the scars of the fire in our, in, in our skin. More of you guys that are sensitive in your skin with the sun. <laughs> Not brown skin. But listen to this, church. We are those who have been rescued from the fire by the hand of our God. We are the people of God, rescued by grace from the fire, invited by God to move forward toward His promises and the future He has for us. Our story is one of fire and grace. That's our story. Yes, it's been tough, but He's been faithful. Yes, we, we've suffered, but when the fire was getting too close, his hand always rescues us. Always grace. His grace is always bigger than the fire around us. And then he encourages Zerubbabel, the governor of Jerusalem. The fourth vision goes for Zerubbabel. This man trying to carry a heavy load, trying to mobilize this group of people, all these people that have left the world for 20 years. Nobody's moving, nobody's mobilizing, and suddenly the Lord speaks to Zerubbabel through Zechariah. Let's read these 10 verses, Zechariah 4. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me. Like a man who is awakened, awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see and, and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right bowl and, 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 and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? I love the Bible. Don't you love the Bible? <laughs> Don't you not know? It's easy. <laughs> I said, No, my Lord. I love it. I love it. It's not easy. <laughs> then he said to me, verse 6, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Sir Obabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace. Grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small beginnings, the day of small things shall rejoice and sh shall see the plumb line in the hands of Zerubbabel. <laughs> Hallelujah. Have you realized, have you realized that everything on the kingdom begins small? The last part, I'm going to start with the last part of this, this, this vision for, for Zechariah, for Zerubbabel. Suddenly, the last declaration is, whoever despised the day of small beginnings shall rejoice. Have you realized that everything in the kingdom of God seems so small, so insignificant? Gideon's army. 32,000 people reduced to 300 men. A kernel of wheat sown in the ground. Promising coming fruit. A mustard of seed. The king of glory coming as a baby. Remember the story of Elisha and the widow's soil. Her husband just died. She has nothing. She thinks she has nothing. And Elisha comes to her and says, what should I do for you? Tell me, what, have, what do you have in your house? And the first response of this woman is, I have nothing. The prophet waits 
And she says, well, except, except a jar of oil. And through that significant thing, through that thing that she was considering almost nothing, she got a magnificent miracle from God. She suddenly remembers that she has a jar of oil left, so small that it's not even worth mentioning. It is so small. It is so insignificant. And I believe, familia, that the enemy cannot steal our oil. But he can make us despise it. It will, it will magnify the need so that we underestimate the provision. Moses, the Pharaoh will not believe me. I don't know how, what it takes. What is in your hand? What's in your house? Well, I, don't, I only have this bunch of liters and this, the, the, the 50 pesos in my wallet. That's impossible. It's almost nothing. It's not even worth mentioning. It's so small. It's only five pieces of bread and two fish. It's so small that it's not even worth mentioning. She only has a small bottle of oil. So small. So small. Many times discouragement blurs of vision. We stop seeing the provision, the gifts that God has given in our church, the resources that God has given in our churches, the people that God has placed in our churches, the ideas and dreams and creativity that God has given us. Because the enemy is going to try to make us focus on the size of the difficulty to minimize what God has already placed in our hands. When we see, when we see little supply, we become paralyzed. When we undervalue what is there, we stop moving. And then we stop building the temple for 20 years. We postpone God's dreams. Because the enemy, in a way, has succeeded in making us think like this widow, I have nothing. I have nothing. But she's got something. And we have something. We have life. We are breathing we are still invited to collaborate with our Father in this great commission. We have a part to play. We've seen in the past, and the past was great, but it's nothing compared to what God's about to do. That's the promise in Isaiah. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over all history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? I'm making a road through the desert, rivers in the badlands. God wants us to first have faith in the small things, in the insignificant, because otherwise we would steal the glory. Yeah, David versus Goliath, you're still, you're just a boy. But it's not the size of what we have, what determines the size of what God can do. Yes. It's not how much oil is in the bottle. It's not because of our curriculum or education level. Yes. It's not about how capable we feel. Yes. The oil may not be much, but it's, it is nothing. It is something. Yeah. It is something. We see it as little because we compare what we have with what other people have. Yeah. And I really believe we need to regain joy yeah. and have faith. With the oil we have. Not just sitting around thinking about the oil we're missing. God is about to do something extraordinary with that little bottle, isn't it? Amen. But the enemy always wants us to distract us, minimizing the supply, so that we will miss out on the miracles. It's interesting that the prophet never asked her, what would you like to have in your house? He asked her, What's in your house? God didn't ask Moses, what kind of ammo would you like to have to face Pharaoh? He said, what's in your hand? <laughs> oh, a piece of wood. Perfect. That's good enough. That's, listen, that's weak enough. That's weak enough. So in this fourth vision that we just read, uh, the Lord wake, wake, wakes up Zachariah. This is so interesting because this is the only vision in the eight visions where, where the Lord wakes up Zachariah. He's like, hey, Zachariah, wake up. This one is so important that you need to be awakened. So it says, the Lord wake me up. 
And he goes through all these things, and I, 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 I paint a picture for you guys during the night so that you can see the, the prophecy in an easier way. Guys, could you put my drawing? <laughs> That's just a quick little thing. Yeah, I watch like a quick things in my notepad. <laughs> and suddenly, the angel comes and he sees a lampstand. But this is a different lampstand than the one that was in the temple, a bit different lampstand. He shows him a lampstand a little different. It's a lampstand with a bowl on top of it. And the bowl is connected to seven lamps through pipelines coming, pipelines, coming from two olive trees, one at each side of the lampstand. And oil is flowing from the olive trees to the bowl of the lampstand. These seven lamps keep burning because the provision of oil is never ending. Context. The priests... In the tabernacle and the priests in the first temple, they had to go to the olive trees, get the olives, squeeze the olives, get the oil, put the oil in a container, carry the container, get into the temple, take the oil from the containers, put the oil on every lamp. So that the fire doesn't run out. But the Lord is saying this time, Zerubbabel, the oil is coming from me. It's not coming from human effort. It's not coming from what you can produce. But actually it's coming from a divine provision that's never ending. It's never running out. This time it won't be by your strength. It won't be by your creativity. It won't be about your capacity. It will be by my spirit, says the Lord. It will be by my spirit. This is not about strength or might. Might or strength speaks of our resources. Our armies. Our money. All that is required in terms of solvency. Quantity. Levers. How many leaders we have. How much is in the bank. Power speaks of personal human capacity, your intellect, your creativity, your ability to solve problems. But God is telling Zerubbabel, it doesn't matter that you don't have enough. It doesn't matter that you don't have enough skills or wisdom because it won't be by human strength nor by human power. It will be by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That was God's promise to Zerubbabel. And this is God's promise to his people. We are his people. It was part of God's redemptive plan for them to return to Jerusalem, rebuild the city, so that the king of glory, will, the humble king, riding a donkey, will enter into that city. And church planting is also part of God's redemptive plan. It's, it's his dream. It's the joy of the heart of the Father that every nation and every people from every, every language would come to the knowledge of God's glory. He's inviting us to be a part of this exciting mission. It's actually the great commission because it's not my mission. It's a mission with Him. We're invited to collaborate alongside Him. He could do that on His own, but every time God does something in the Bible, He does it through sons and daughters. We're invited into an exciting journey. Yeah. And we, 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 we are joyful because the successful and the, the success and the outcome of this mission is warranted. Not by might, not by power, but by His Spirit, says the Lord. Mm. The, the verse 7 says, I love the way the Lord dares the mountains. It says, Who are you? Who do you think you are, great mountain? <laughs> Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. 
And he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace. Grace to it. God's speaking to the mountain. Who are you? Who do you think you are before my chosen people? Listen, if we surround the mountain, or if we climb the mountain, we get the glory. But if God makes the mountain to become a plain, he gets the glory. And then his people will be singing grace. It was so grace. It was so grace. It was nothing about us. It was, there, was, there were mountains in front of us. But then suddenly by his mighty grace and mighty power, it became a plain. And we are walking in plain ground. And I really believe this is a word for us because we've seen the challenges. We've seen the mountains. And God's not saying, no, no, no. You're not called to surround this mountain. You're not, come to, you're not called to find a way to climb it. I'll, I'll make it a plain. I'll make it a plain in front of you, Confluence Familia. Yeah. I'll make it a plain. Because only to God be the glory. Yeah. He is our champion. He makes mountains in front of us to become plains. Yes, I worked, but it's God in me. He's working through me. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, for it was not I, but the grace, once again, of God that is with me. It wasn't me. God was working through me by his grace. And I really believe, family, that many of the things that we have tried to achieve or move by force, God wants to do now by his spirit. I believe God wants to surprise his church with new opportunities. Renew encouragement. Renewed strength. With clarity of thought and strategies like we've never had before. Because God's speaking to us these words which we need to mark. It is by my spirit. Oh, I feel weak. Absolutely welcome to the club. This is exactly the place where I needed you. In a place of weakness. You've come to the end of yourself. Now I'm ready to use you. I am ready to take the pieces and I'll make a beautiful work of art with these pieces. You are, you, you are a Tyson snatched from the fire. And I'll use that piece of wood. Because now you, 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 you realize. I love the way the Holdings put it. They said, uh, the revelation of our weaknesses opens the door for God's power. That me, we may come to a new revelation of how weak, how weak and unresourced we are. What a gift to realize that. Because if not, all, God always takes us to a journey to realize that, to figure that out. So then he can use us. But he's promising us that he will do it by his spirit. He still has many people in our cities. He still has many people in other cities. Waiting to hear the great news of salvation. And many people waiting to be reconciled with God. And thousands of baptisms, hundreds of leaders, dozens of churches may seem like an impossible task. It is an impossible task. But we're not being driven by a taskmaster, as Travis said. We're drawn. We're invited by a loving father to play our part in his dream. For all the nations and cities on the earth. And I think the question in front of us in the end of this session is, uh, what seems impossible? What, what seems impossible? Have we come to the end of ourselves? Are we exhausted of carrying the oil, of producing the oil? Are we ready to surrender and allow God to be the provider, the never-ending provider of oil flowing through our pipelines. The oil that's flowing to make the, that lamp burn. I really believe God's inviting us to depend, to surrender, 
to acknowledge our weakness. Just come to a place that says it's not anymore by power. It's not anymore by budget. It's by his spirit, says the Lord. May we stand and just respond to God for a moment. If the band would like to come, we just... But I think this is a personal moment. More than a, 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 a moment of moving our emotions, it's just a moment of surrender. A moment that we can make an altar before the Lord. I believe there are leaders here, and we are leaders here, that see ourselves like there's nothing in my church I can offer to this vision. And I believe God's saying, no, 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 no. There's something. Well, it's so small. It's not worth even mentioning. God says, "Uh uh-uh, the jar of oil. I need the jar of oil. I need your jar. It's not somebody else's jar, somebody send ascending church jar. No, no, no. It's your jar. I believe God's about to do miracles, that we're going to witness things, that we, we will be opening our eyes and just singing with Zerubbabel, grace. It was grace. It's grace. There's no other way but grace that brought us here. So why don't you just respond to God? Maybe some of you may, may come up front and just in a way that you allow your heart to respond and say, God, here's my jar of oil. I'm exhausted of producing oil for this church. I'm exhausted of of trying to make it on my own, trying to produce the oil to keep this place in burning. But the Lord's saying, no, 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 it's it's about time that you surrender. And I will be the one that provides the never-ending oil in your life, in your ministry, in your calling, in the vision. This is not a vision that's moved by oil produced by human hands. This is not the oil that's produced by the leaders. This is the oil produced in heaven. That's the one that ignites his church on fire. He is the divine flame. He is the never-ending. He is the flame that... He gets that bush on fire. A fire that never runs out. He's the God of resources. He's the God of unlimited power and resources. We are here just surrendering God. You can come to the front. You can stay in your place. But I would invite you to come to a place of acknowledging the lacks. Acknowledging what we don't have, but rejoicing because that's the moment where we are right in the perfect place. Right in the perfect space where God can use somebody that knows that He's a nobody. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is perfect in witness. In witness. Lord, we want the power of Christ. Spirit of Jesus. Igniting our mission. Propelling us with the wind of your spirit. Pouring your oil in us. Light the fire again, Jesus. Come to your bride. Mobilize us in the mission. Not because of what we have. But because we have you, we have everything we need to be mobilized in this mission. We just surrender. We surrender. Can you say it? We just surrender. Jesus, we surrender. We surrender. To the all provider of oil, we surrender. To the never-ending source of power and anointing. To the never-ending source You are the limited God. And we are trusting that you are about to do a new work, a beautiful new work that will surprise us. In the name of Jesus. Let's just respond individually.